Okay. So hi everyone. Andrew Zappe from Evolution AI, and I'll be hosting today's London Machine Learning Meetup. Today we have Ovma Levy from Facebook AI Research and Tel Aviv University, who's going to talk to us about natural language processing without big label data. So as usual, the talk will last about 40 minutes and it's going to be followed by a uh, Q&A session. So you can ask your questions throughout the talk uh, using the Q&A tool. Also, if you have like a doubt about something, uh, just ask it there and we can interrupt the talk and, and almost it's happy, it's good to be happy to, to answer that question. Okay, so as usual, the talk is going to be uh, published on our YouTube channel and I'm going to share the link uh, in, in a moment. So without further ado, I leave the stage to Omar. Thanks, Giuseppe. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Omer. Um, and uh, uh, like we said, uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to interrupt and ask. Uh, I'd like this to be as interactive a talk as possible, uh, given the circumstances, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll do what we can with, with uh, the current technology. So um, today, I'd like to tell you a bit about how uh, we can train uh, NLP models, uh, models of natural language processing, without thousands of labeled examples. So let, let's start by having a look at how standard NLP models are trained nowadays. Um, we first pre-train a model, like a large transformer, um, and, and we trained it on massive amounts of unlabeled text, like take Wikipedia and all the news in the world and all the books in the world and uh, all the blog posts and everything. Um, and, and once we've done this, this massive pre-training process, we then fine tune it on um, annotated examples. And once it's trained, we can then of course test the model and, and hope that it generalizes as well to more annotated examples uh, from a similar distribution. Now, um, sorry. Um, now, now pre-training is, is great because we basically have, you know, as many examples as we like. We, we, we have as much un, uh, uh, unlimited kind of raw text uh, as we can put our hands on. But unfortunately, uh, that's not quite true for annotated examples. So how do we get those? Well, crowdsourcing is probably the most common way to collect annotated examples. Um, we can design the task, upload it to a platform like um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk, and, and then pay lay people, uh, basically anyone who's literate, uh, to annotate our, uh, our data. Now, I don't know about you folks, but if, if you've done any crowdsourcing before, you'll know that it's not quite as simple uh, as it sounds. Um, first, designing a good annotation task involves a lot of trial and error. Uh, and this ends up consuming our time as researchers. Secondly, it's not always trivial to scale up. Um, it, you're going to need significant amounts of, of uh, funding of, of like a, an annotation budget uh, if you want to collect uh, more than 10,000 examples. And the funny thing is that even if you have invested uh, the time to design a proper annotation task and the money to scale it up, uh, we're still going to end up with data that is somewhat artificial. Um, and that's because this data was created by crowd workers with artificial incentives and not by real users of an actual application. Now, um, you can, you can uh, kind of imagine uh, that, that uh, not only is it, is it you know, difficult to uh, overcome these uh, uh, artifacts and kind of simulate this, this real environment that, that uh, uh, people who are not actually users of your, of your, of your system uh, can contribute uh, annotations. Uh, there's also the issue that it's not always practical because you might be dealing with some kind of language 
that isn't available on Mechanical Turk or some kind of domain that requires some uh, specific expertise. And I'll give you an example that's like very realistic for me, or at least was very realistic for me. Um, uh, well, over the past year, um, imagine that the uh, Israeli Ministry of Health uh, wants to set up an automatic system that answers questions about COVID vaccines. Now, it's going to be pretty difficult to collect that kind of data on Mechanical Turk. You're going to need probably, you know, someone who knows a thing or two about the COVID vaccines. That's kind of the domain expertise. And you're going to need to do it in Hebrew and Arabic and maybe some other languages as well. So this leads us up to, to the question that I've been asking myself over the past few months. How can we train NLP models without many labeled examples? So the main paradigm in which we study this question is called few shot learning. And here we, we assume that we have as much raw data as we want, but only a small amount of labeled examples. And now that, uh, the way we're going to try to solve few shot learning is by aligning the pre-training task where we use raw text to train um, with the target task for which we have uh, a bit of labeled data. So we want to make these two tasks as similar as possible. And what a lot of folks have been trying out recently over the past year is something called prompting. In prompting, we're basically reformulating the target task to resemble pre-training. We're kind of trying to cheat uh, in a sense, and, and trick the model into thinking that um, we're giving it an instance of language modeling or masked language modeling, where in fact we're giving it maybe sentiment analysis or natural language inference or some other downstream task. But in this talk, I want to focus on the other direction, on task-specific pre-training. Here, we're, only go we're going to try and simulate the target task during pre-training using only raw text. Are there any questions until now? Um, I don't think there are any questions until now. Okay, I'll carry on then. Please do feel free to stop me, otherwise we're gonna end really early. <laughs> um, so in the first part, part of the talk, uh, I'd like to focus on um, some first steps of, that we've done in this area of, of task-specific pre-training. Uh, we did this, this is a project that we did in Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv University, um, uh, where we introduced a new pre-training task uh, that makes it possible to train good question-answering models with only a couple hundred examples. So in this work, we're going to focus on extractive question answering. Um, and in this task, we're basically given a document and a question about it. Um, and the answer is some kind of span of words, uh, basically an n-gram uh, in the given document. So let's uh, take an example. And this is a famous example from uh, the squad uh, data set from Stanford. Um, so uh, given the Wikipedia page of Nikola Tesla, uh, the question, what does AC stand for, uh, can be answered with the span alternating currents. Okay, and you can imagine all sorts of other questions, um, such as uh, um, when was Nikola Tesla born, uh, etc. Now, um, Current models are very, very good at answering these kind of questions, and they can even reach human performance um, under certain circumstances, uh, under certain very specific assumptions. And, and one of these assumptions is that we have an order of 100,000 training examples of questions and answers. But I mean, is, is this assumption realistic? Is this something that we can really, you know, collect if we have a startup or a new product or 
uh, in an emergency like, like COVID. Um, what if we're only able to collect, let's say, a thousand examples, or maybe even less, maybe just a hundred examples? What could we do in that situation? So we set, up ben we set up an academic benchmark that actually simulates this situation. Um, and uh, I won't go into too much of the details, um, but I'll just say that we took um, eight existing data sets and sampled small training sets of uh, 16 to 1,000 examples uh, from each one of them. Um, so now what I really like about this benchmark uh, is that we can actually for the first time uh, draw this kind of curve uh, that, that paints a much more complete picture of how well question answering models work. Uh, because, because now we can actually test them on much smaller amounts of, uh, of data that I think uh, reflects a much more realistic setting uh, than uh, what do we do if we have 100,000 training examples. So as you can see from this graph, and these are all, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, mainstream, uh, high-performing models. I wouldn't say state-of-the-art because, uh, you know, uh, these things change very, very quickly, uh, but they're very close to state-of-the-art. Um, and, and you can see that they're doing quite poorly when we have, uh, let's say, 100 examples or 200 examples. Um, uh, and, and we'd like to, to get much closer to, to this kind of 92% performance in squad, 92% uh, F1, um, when we have the uh, full data. We'd like to get very close to that, but with not 100,000 examples, but let's say with 500 examples, 1,000 examples, and uh, which is kind of the more realistic situation. Any questions until now? There are no questions from the audience, but uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, when you sample the the questions from the different data sets, do you yeah. sample them from just one of the, the data sets or across the all the data sets that you mentioned? Yeah. Do Great you... question. Great question. So we actually sample um, for each one of these data sets, for each sample size, let's say squad and 32, we sample five training sets. So we, okay. we get kind of a, a variant, uh, we, we, we kind of capture the variance that you'd get from just, you know, annotating 32 random examples on mm -hmm. squad. Uh, and of course we repeat this process for squad, for news QA, for, for tri trivia QA, and we don't actually share examples across data sets. Okay. And um, the numbers in the graph are an average between all this? No, they, they're just on squad. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't say that. These but, numbers yeah. are just in squad, okay? And squad is, of course, a much easier data set. It's much more academic. Um, the numbers are even lower when you look at, at more realistic data sets like natural questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Mm, no, I don't think there are any questions. Okay, all right. Um, Okay, so, so you see like question answering is not really solved. Uh, maybe it's solved with 100,000 examples, but, but uh, uh, in, the, in the more realistic setting, we're not quite there yet. Um, so what can we do differently? And in this work, uh, what we did is we, we basically simulate the problem of extractive question answering during pre-training. But how exactly are we going to create questions and answers from unlabeled text? Okay, because you know it's unlabeled text. We don't really have any kind of nicely annotated questions and answers. So this is where where this nice, um, really nice observation that uh, Ori Ram, the, the first author, made, um, and and uh, what he he noticed was that some spans. Um, like names, for example, uh, tend to occur multiple times in the same passage. So let's look at an example. So in this part, passage, um, uh, we've deleted a few spans. Uh, we've, oh, sorry, we've highlighted a few spans that, that occur more than once. Uh, so for example, you can see 
uh, declaration by United Nation occurs twice, and the word Roosevelt appears three times. So these are what we call recurring spans. And um, to simulate question answering, we're going to turn all of these recurring spans into pseudo questions. And we're going to do that by replacing all of their recurrences with a special question token. And we're going to replace all of these occurrences except for a single instance uh, within each of these clusters, uh, which is going to act as the answer. So going back to our example, if we have three instances of Roosevelt, two of them are going to be replaced with the question token and turned into pseudo questions. And one instance of Roosevelt is going to act as their answer. And it's, uh, 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 each of these pseudo questions is, is actually going to need to predict um, the one remaining instance of Roosevelt as, as their answer. Likewise, uh, uh, one instance of Declaration by United Nations is going to turn into a pseudo question uh, with the uh, other instance acting as its answer. Any questions? Yeah, we have, uh, James raised his hand, so I'll let him ask a question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so you're selecting, I mean, you're spotting these repeated uh, engrams. Uh, what do you do about words like the, which uh, will be repeated all over the place? And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean are, are you dropping stop words? Yeah, excellent question. So we, we had a couple of heuristics to uh, kind of avoid uh, the and the likes. Uh, we did drop stop words. Um, I think I think we had a few. I, I actually don't remember all the details, but I think we had a few things that were related to the frequency of the tokens. Um, and uh, but basically, we we like you know we fil we filtered out the 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 kind of. Uh, obvious uh, non-candidates, uh, and, and we usually got very good things, very good spans. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, no more questions at the moment. All right. So, um, so, so that, that's pre-training. We're basically creating these uh, uh, pseudo questions. Um, and then, and then kind of teaching the model to, to predict their answer uh, from the remaining uh, instance of the recurring span cluster. So what do we do uh, during uh, uh, fine tuning? Um, so at fine tuning, we're actually going to get some real question answering examples. And, and we want to make the fine tuning task as, as close as possible to the pre-training task. And to do that, uh, we're going to append the question token, the one we use to mask all these uh, spans during pre-training, uh, we're going to append the special question token to the actual question and then use it to predict the answer, okay? So in this example, you see that we just added question, full stop, and now we're asking the model to basically point from the question to uh, the beginning and the end of, of the answer that would, uh, of the span that basically answers this question. Okay, so the, the pre-training task and the fine tuning task, and, and of course inference are really well aligned and they're, they're actually using exactly the same parameters. We don't need to introduce new parameters uh, uh, during fine tuning. So um, we've talked about pre-training, fine tuning and inference, but you know, every model needs a name, right? Um, so we called our model Splinter uh, and it has a cheesy backronym, uh, which is span level pointer. Um, so I'm going to refer to our model as Splinter from now on. So uh, <laughs> just, just, just so uh, you know, we're all aligned with the terminology. Okay, so let's see how, uh, uh, what Splinter can do in a uh, few shot question answer. So let's start with squad. Uh, 
Over here, we can see that the performance on squad, uh, when trained with small amounts of examples, uh, is, is basically, uh, um, we see this, this kind of um, uh, uh, full uh, line that represents splinter, and we have these dotted lines which represent the, the baselines. Um, you'll see that we have Roberta and two different implementations of Spanbert. And, and I think it's pretty obvious to see from this uh, uh, chart that, that um, Splinter is doing much better than the baselines. Um, we get to around 73 uh, F1 uh, with only uh, a bit more than 100 examples, 128 examples. Uh, and we even passed the 80% mark with 512 examples. Um, these are, are pretty big performance gaps uh, when it comes to squad. Um, I'll maybe add one more thing that what we're seeing here is actually the base model. So these models are all like BERT base, uh, only 110 million parameters. Uh, we actually get much, much higher numbers when, when we scale up Splinter. Um, specifically on Squad, if I'm not mistaken, we passed the 80% uh, uh, F1 uh, at around uh, um, 100 examples. Uh, when we use Splinter Large inst instead of Splinter Base. So um, we, we, we're getting very, very close to this kind of, you know, 92% saturation point uh, with, with, you know, only about 100 examples. 100, 200 examples. I, I, I don't remember where exactly the saturation point is with the large model. Um, but, you know, even at 80%, what we're talking about, uh, pretty good performance that... Uh, uh, we only started getting with, with uh, uh, kind of the, the, the Elmo level, BERT level models at the beginning uh, on the full data set. So, um, of course, we didn't just te test it on squad. Um, we also see similar trends um, when we look at uh, data sets with harder questions, like natural questions. Uh, this is um, <coughs> Google's natural questions uh, our data set where the questions were basically taken from, you know, uh, what people searched on Google. Um, uh, these are obviously much harder to optimize. Uh, we need more examples here, but still we see uh, a, a very nice, uh, a very meaningful gap between Splinter and uh, Roberta and uh, Spanbert. Um, and of course, uh, even when we try it on other domains like news QA, uh, we kind of see the same trend and the same gaps uh, between Splinter and other models. Any questions? No, there are no questions at the moment. Okay. So to sum up the results uh, of, of uh, Splinter, um, when Actually, it comes- Sorry, I think that there is a question now. By Aviv. So it says, uh, can you please expand about the format of the auto-generated question answer pairs? The answer is in, in the recurred item, but how exactly is the question generated and how the question token helps to create the formulated questions? Okay, excellent question. So, so um, there's actually no question. Uh, we don't really generate a question, it's a pseudo question. Um, let's look at this example here we see uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and question uh, aid Harry Hopkins. So uh, you see this kind of half sentence context here. Um, it's basically saying, uh, um, what is the best uh, um, substitute for this, for this token here? Um, if you think about questions, they're basically statements with a hole in them. And, and we're actually doing that here. We're, we're creating statements with a hole. Um, you can look at um, another example would be here with declaration by United Nations. So the text of the something was drafted at the White House on December 29th, 1941. So you could, you could rephrase this and think about this as a question, like um, what was drafted at the White House on December 29th, 1941? It, it's, it's basically the same semantics, 
but we're kind of using a slightly different semantic form. One is assertive and one is uh, uh, kind of in this uh, question form. Okay. And we, we also have another another question mm -hmm. from, sure. uh, well, Jan has his hands raised, so I'll, I'll let him talk. Mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. I just wondered for the news QA and the previous example, <coughs> yep. would you remind me what the benchmark is for the for the fully trained in the in the squad yeah example, yeah so in squad system. it was like 92 um uh, we can so human performance is around 90 on squad uh anything beyond that is basically like you know overfitting the benchmark and, and learning all sorts of artifacts um in in natural questions uh human performance is is i think a, a bit lower maybe 85 or 90 percent i can't remember exactly but the you know the fully trained models um, gets a bit lower than that. Like I think I think Spanbert gets around eighty three percent F one uh, with the full data set, um, and and I don't remember the exact number for News QA, but it's again around like eighty something percent, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we'll still there's still like a big gap here. Um, but but I will also add that this is the base model and the, the numbers of the large model are actually bigger. Um, we're, we're still running those experiments. So I don't have all the numbers, but specifically the experiments on squad uh, actually finished. Uh, so, uh, so, so I know those numbers by heart. Any more questions? Yes, we have another hands raised. By uh, Damovina. Hi. Uh, if, I just wanted to ask, like, can you explain a little bit in depth regarding the architecture of this printer? Uh, what kind of input, uh, like, what kind of changes have takes place in between the entire model? What kind of input? What kind of what again? Like what is exactly going to like the art model architecture, uh, the input uh, size, like for example, in transformers, we see that 512 or 768 tokens can be taken at an input once. Yeah, so, the, the, uh, the, the, the architecture is, is identical to uh, Bert base. It's, it's like a transformer encoder, uh, 768 dimensions, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. Uh, 12 layers. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only difference is that we have a, a kind of a, 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 a task specific layer on the top that we also use during pre training. Uh, I didn't actually want to get into that because that's, that's a, a, a kind of a, a bit too detailed for this kind of talk. Uh, but you can read about it in the paper. It's called the QASS layer. Um, and it basically allows us to answer okay. multiple okay. questions at the same time. Okay. And uh, like a small uh, question, maybe if you can mm -hmm. help us to understand that, how is this uh, splinter model uh, different from the self-supervised uh, learning technique? Like I just read an article from that Facebook AI blog uh, that we partially label some of the data to identify the other parts of the, like the, um, like the other parts of the unseen data a better way. But how can you just explain like how different is that self-supervised learning approach compared to one that we are explaining over here? I'm I'm not sure I fully uh, I I understand the reference, so um, not not sure I'm I, I I'm fully familiar with with uh, the work you, you you're referencing. So uh, <laughs> I can't I can't really. So I actually that I actually read that uh, Facebook um, uh, AI blog article yeah. uh, where uh, self-supervised learning is a concept was being explained where you partially yeah, hide. It's, it's just it's like you mask some of them. You're talking about masked yeah. language modeling. Self-supervised learning is a much yeah. broader concept. We're, what we're doing here is self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning is oh. basically, um, you know, you have raw text. It's unlabeled. 
what can you do with it? How can you teach a model? How can you train a model with it? Um, so this is a form, a, a specific form of self-supervised learning that is uh, geared towards extractive question answering. Okay. 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 Um, you can you have other variants of self-supervised learning like mass language modeling, which is what you know Bert uses, Bert Roberta, yeah. uh, Spanbert uh, used to uh, uh, pre-train uh, their models. Right, right, okay. exactly. So here we did not That's do why any, I wanted any, to any ask. mass language modeling. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. I guess we can go on and then ask answer okay. some more questions in the final QA. No worries. Okay, so uh, to sum up our results, um, yeah, when it comes to future question answering, Splinter improves uh, quite a bit uh, on performance, uh, and and this performance, uh, this improvement is actually consistent across the board uh, on all the data sets that we tested. Um, <laughs> By the way, we also found, I didn't, I didn't talk about this, but um, even when we do have uh, a lot of uh, training examples, uh, Splinter is actually just as good as the other baselines, and, and sometimes it's a, even a bit better. So uh, you, if you know that you're doing, uh, that you've got, uh, uh, you're going to do extractive question answering, um, you've got nothing to lose by using Splinter. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to conclude this part of the talk, and um, there's another part that that's pretty short. So um, uh, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to to fit uh, both of them uh, given the time. Um, in the, in this part, we showed that uh, uh, question answering uh, in kind of the more realistic setting, the the few shot setting, uh, is still not solved. It's still an open challenge. Um, we showed that Splinter. Uh, uh, basically can simulate uh, the target task during pre-training uh, by, by turning recurring spans into pseudo questions. Um, and, you know, it seems like it pays off. Um, now we could talk more about how to kind of extend this idea of, of target task uh, pre-training or task specific pre-training uh, beyond question answering, but instead, I'd like you all to think about a slightly more profound question. How do we, as humans, learn a task, learn a new task? So do we really learn only from a few examples or is there something extra, something that we're missing in, in the few shot paradigm? Let me maybe phrase it a bit differently. How do we explain a new task to one another? Do we use examples or do we use something else? So I'm going to argue that we use instructions. And about a year ago, um, we started asking ourselves whether models uh, could also learn new tasks from instructions in natural language. And, and, and basically the, this kind of, you know, the, the thinking about this question led us to, to uh, a new paradigm in NLP. Uh, and, and I think we were maybe one of the first people to kind of put it on archive, but a lot of other people were, were, were thinking about the similar ideas at the same time. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to use our terminology uh, to explain this, this concept. Um, we're calling it the, the instruction paradigm. Basically, you're given uh, a description of the task uh, in natural language, and, and this description may include examples as part of it, um, but it could also contain a lot more. Uh, for example, instructions can explain how to perform the task, and also how not to perform the task. And this negative information is actually really hard to convey in an example-based setting. <clears throat> so for, for example, you can give um, 
a question answering uh, model, examples of uh, correct, sent uh, correct answers, um, but it's not entirely clear how it could use incorrect answers to, to train itself. So let's look at a few examples of, of what I mean by, by instructions. Um, we could ask, uh, for example, the model to write the nth word in a sentence. Or we could ask something more complicated, like uh, read an article from Nature and answer this complex question about it, uh, which coronavirus vaccines uh, were found to be at least 50% effective after two weeks. This is, of course, much, much more applicative task. Now, it turns out that the NLP community has actually been writing elaborate instructions for quite some time. And they've been doing it in the form of annotation tasks on Mechanical Turk. Let's look at an example. So these instructions that you see here are what human annotators were shown when crowdsourcing questions and answers for squad. You can see that there's kind of this general description of the task, followed by a paragraph about which, you know, the annotator needs to write actually questions about it. Uh, and, and then we have some extras, uh, you know, do's and don'ts, uh, how to perform the task, how not to perform the task. So we looked at these kind of instructions and said, you know, if, if any literate human being can read these instructions and understand what they're supposed to do, shouldn't models be able to do the same? And that's exactly what the Turking test is, is all about. So um, we want to test whether language models can execute the same instructions that humans were given on Mechanical Turk. And the Turking test includes three annotation tasks that we took from Mechanical Turk. These are very mainstream uh, 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 NLP tasks. Um, we have SNLI, Squad, and uh, news QA, it, and each of these tasks involves writing some kind of supplementary text uh, to a given input, um, but they also have uh, uh, their own quirks. Uh, each one is a bit different. Uh, so we did get kind of a, 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 a let's say, a not a very diverse set, but, but some kind of distribution over the kind of uh, tasks that people uh, uh, ask uh, people in Mechanical Turk to, uh, to carry out. So what do you all think? Uh, can language models follow these instructions? Anybody want to try and answer? Take a guess. Yeah, I don't think we have any volunteer. <laughs> but I, I guess it's, it's pretty challenging. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> to put it bluntly, no, <laughs> uh, language models are pretty bad at, at, at following annotation guidelines uh, uh, that were meant for humans. Um, but you know, like let, let's be a, uh, the devil's advocate for a bit and say, you know, maybe maybe we're, we're being a bit too harsh on our models. Uh, these are very long instructions, very elaborate instructions. They they don't assume that there's a model behind behind the wheel, but but a human. Um, so, so what happens if, if we try something simpler? Um, let, let's see if a model uh, can, can write, for example, a sentence that mentions London. So we gave this to GPT-2, uh, and you can see that, you know, pretty good. London is a city of contrast. It's even, uh, you know, I'd say it's even a correct statement. Um, but what about writing a sentence that doesn't mention London. So this is what GPT-2 produced. And just to clarify, um, the model was asked to generate any sentence in the world as long as it doesn't contain London. And it generated one that begins with London. OK, so maybe London is, you know, is a bad example. Let's try something else. Write a sentence that doesn't mention cats. And <laughs> once again, the model is unable to uh, understand and execute uh, even this very, very simple set of instructions. 
Now, it turns out that this is quite a trend. Um, when we ask a model uh, to write a sentence that mentions something, it usually gets it right. But when we ask it to write sent a sentence without mentioning something, uh, basically don't think about pink elephants, uh, then, then it's going to completely fail. All right. Um, excuse me for one moment. I have a little kid interrupt. I'll be back in a second. Hello. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So in conclusion, um, we talked about how massive label data sets might not always reflect the reality of an actual application. And um, we suggested few shot learning as a more practical setting uh, for conducting academic research that, that can, you know, actually reflect what's going on in, in reality. Um, we then showed that uh, Splinter can use task-specific pre-training to simulate question-answering examples from raw text and essentially prepare itself for the actual task of, of extractive question-answering uh, before it even sees uh, even one labeled example. Finally, uh, we talked about uh, a kind of science fiction setting, if you will, uh, where models can just read, understand, and execute instructions in natural, uh, in natural language without having to learn from loads of examples. And um, sooner or later, I believe that we will uh, get there. But uh, as for now, uh, it seems like this problem is far from being solved. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Omer. That was a very interesting talk. Um, so please, guys, keep asking questions in the Q&A tool and raise your hand if you'd like to ask the question yourself, and we'll, we'll unmute you. So ju just like to, to, to follow up on your, on your last example. Yeah. So when you were talking about GPT-2, I think that one of the natural questions is, have you tried GPT-3? Does, does it do any better? We would love to try GPT-3 if only OpenAI gave us... Uh, oh, they don't give uh, you any, any like, access totally to the access API. <laughs> we actually, um, so if, if, if you take a peek in the paper and archive, we have a footnote there that we applied uh, in June 2020, a year okay. ago, uh, to get access to GPT-3. And um, we've sent a couple of emails. <laughs> uh, we have not received any, any word. Uh, back from okay. OpenAI, unfortunately. Okay. Actually, um, so, so somebody just just messaged in the Q and I said that they did, did just try GPT three. Yeah. And yeah, the sentences that do not do not contain London are "Welcome to London" or "I am London." Yeah. yeah. London is a long word. Yeah. So we have a few. It doesn't friends seem with, like it made a big improvement. Yeah, we have a few friends with access to GPT three, and, and and they tried some of these examples for us, and and I mean the failure cases. Uh, are true for GPT-3. They're, they're true for also a bunch of other models uh, that, that um, uh, are now out there. Um, we tried uh, the uh, GPT-Neo and GPT-J that just came mm -hmm. out from Eleuther, uh, Eleuther AI. Um, and again, we see, we see kind of the same failure cases. Uh, we also played around with T5, 11 billion. Mm -hmm. um, th these are pretty consistent trends. I mean, you can always find cases where kind of it gets it right by mistake yeah, yeah. Um, because you know it it kind of makes let's say an educated guess um, but it doesn't you know you can you can very easily find something that 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 will uh, uh, make it fail uh, mm -hmm. without being too adversarial yeah okay so let's go through some some of the questions from the audience um, so we have a question for uh, Paul. Paul, would you like to ask your question? If so, raise your hand, otherwise I'll read it out. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll unmute you. Thanks. Uh, so, so this is kind of about, uh, I was just a bit surprised about this idea of um, just adding the question token at the end. Um, mm -hmm. All right. I was wondering, did you try to make it more similar to the pre-training? So, so like, you know, replacing what, who, you know, where with the question token? The... Um, so the thing is that uh, we, we want to align pre-training and fine-tuning slash inference as much as possible. Um, in pre-training, we're basically telling it, listen, you're going to learn that uh, uh, this the, the, the question token basically represents this pseudo question. It represents kind of the surrounding context. And you're going to use that token, that contextualized token, uh, to point at the correct answer. So we want fine tuning and, and, and inference to, to actually be the same in that sense. And we want it to basically use that special token as a cue uh, to, to tell the model, okay, now you need to contextualize the surround, look at your surrounding, contextualize what would be a good fit in this place, and then point to uh, uh, the relevant uh, uh, position. Um, I'm guessing that if you had um, information about the entity type, uh, we could have like question underscore who, question underscore what, or whatever. And, and it would probably improve performance a bit. Um, but that kind of assumes that you have some kind of pre-processing uh, in the document. And we kind of wanted to, to avoid any of that. Oh, I was thinking something much simpler, just the order of words. So here, question is put after the end of the sentence. And I was thinking, well, when you have a question that contains the word what, who, and so on, then that word is actually the place where you would put the missing word. Um, yeah, that might work. Um, we did try putting question before the sentence and we found that after the sentence was a bit better. Um, I think that it's mainly because, um, it's, it basically learns what would be a good substitute for, for question. And usually the answer is something that appears after the question. So yeah. you might actually have, you know, examples of, of actual questions where, where the answer is masked out by chance. I mean, because you might have some, you know, questions and answers in Wikipedia. Uh, and I think that might give it a bit of a cue that, that um, uh, it's, it's probably a bit better, a bit more natural for the question token to appear after the question. That, that makes sense. So uh, we have a question from David. David, would you like to ask the question yourself? Yeah, can okay, I unmute you? Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, my question was, uh, because before you have shown the performance of Splinter uh, already in the, in the target task after fine tuning, but I was uh, curious about uh, the performance in the raw data and mm -hmm. how that does, does that compare to, to the performance after training in just a hundred uh, examples in the fine tuning? Um, so the performance in the raw data, you mean like the pre-training objective? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, we have, we obviously, when we were doing the research, we were looking at a lot of these kind of loss curves. Um, we didn't measure F1 or accuracy as you would measure with extractive question answering um, because uh, we were more looking at the distribution that we get. Uh, that, that's basically what the model uses during training. Um, I don't remember the actual values in terms of like, um, you know, accuracy or it wasn't even accuracy. It's kind of like cross entropy loss uh, that we got. Um, but, it, but it's pretty low and I'm sure that there are more optimization tricks that we could use to make it even lower or train on a larger model. 
Um, yeah. Okay, okay. It was just to, to see if the fine tuning part was uh, very de uh, decisive in the in the outcome or in the pre training uh, uh, part. You were already learning a lot about. Oh, oh, I think, okay. So you're asking like what happens in the zero shot situation? Like what if after pre training, I just like run the test? Yeah. R exactly. Run inference and question answering. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we ran these experiments. Uh, we actually get surprisingly high results. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's like, um, I think for squad, it was like around 30 or 40%. Uh, with the base model, with the large model, it's even more. Um, it's, it's like, it, it really gives it like a really good head start in that sense. And I'm pretty sure if we, you know, if we scaled this up and we ran this on not only Wikipedia, but maybe text that actually contains a lot more kind of questions and answers that you would get these, these examples by chance, like these kind of uh, real questions by chance, I'm pretty sure uh, performance would go up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there, there's a quick question from Alberto who's asking if the annotation instructions data set is available, I guess the one for, for the Turkey test. If, if uh, which data set again? The, well, it, it says uh, the, the annotation, annotation instruction. instruction, but I guess yeah, it's the one for the yeah. Turkey so, test. Um, first of all, uh, we, can, we can make the data available. Um, but uh, I, I, I do need to recommend uh, work, uh, subsequent work that, that um, colleagues from, from Seattle uh, uh, did from uh, AI2. Uh, they did, um, they basically created this suite of uh, tasks called natural instructions. Um, which is, we were kind of thinking of doing this for the Turkey test, but we didn't have enough manpower and we wanted to get something else. Uh, uh, and they basically took 61 uh, tasks from Mechanical Turk. They, they also broke them down very nicely. They have this kind of uh, unified format uh, for all the instruction sets. And I think that's kind of the, 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 the benchmark that I would work with. Uh, the framework that I would work with if, if I was going in to, to try to research and, and get models to explicitly learn how to process instructions. It's called uh, nat natural, natural Instructions. And I think the first author is Mishra, Mishra et al, 2021. Thanks. Um, so we have a question from Marco. Do you want to ask the question yourself? No? Okay, so Marco asks, when we see models failing in understanding instructions, whether those models pre-trained on different tasks, would fine tuning on an instruction understanding task improve the results? So in, in the natural instructions paper, they actually tried uh, training on instructions and then transferring to instructions of new tasks that were unseen uh, during training, and it completely fails. So, <laughs> I mean, it does like, you know, slightly better, but, but it's, we're, we're still talking about like very, very low uh, performance. Um, and, 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 and I will also add that in the natural instructions, um, they kind of uh, really tried to trim down the instructions as much as possible. So, for example, in SNLI, in, in the Turking test, uh, we're actually expecting, given, given a premise, to, we're expecting the model to produce three sentences, uh, 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 an entailment sentence, a contradiction sentence, and a neutral sentence. Uh, and for example, natural instructions, they're breaking it down to like three different tasks. Given a premise, produce just an entailment sentence or just a contradiction sentence. And then the model has a much higher chance of getting things right by chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a question from Jan. Would you like to ask the question yourself? Okay, I'll read that. So Jan asks, what are the limitations of this approach? Uh, I guess it's referring to the first part of the talk. Are there yeah. any NLP problems which cannot uh, which cannot be reformulated? Sorry, 
Are there NLP problems which cannot reformulate input to match the pre-training task in this way? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think it's very difficult. Uh, let's say not difficult, but it's not trivial to find a good um, task specific pre training task. I think it requires kind of really understanding the task, uh, a pretty good intuition about language. Like I said, like Ori had this, this kind of wild intuition that, you know, we have these recurring spans and, and we can use them to make questions. Um, and uh, probably it, it, it's, not, it's not something that you could do on every task. I will give an example of where, uh, what people did for, um, for summarization, which is nice. There are actually two papers, one uh, called Pegasus. Uh, it's pretty famous, uh, where they basically did something very similar to BART and T5, where they basically said, um, let's delete one sentence from the context and then ask the model to predict that sentence, the missing sentence. And it turns out that this is a pretty good kind of way to warm up a summarization model. Another example is for multi-document summarization, where if you have like N reviews of a product, um, they're basically saying, let's leave one out and try to reproduce the Nth review from uh, given N minus one reviews of the same product. Um, and, and that's kind of a, this self-supervised uh, 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 objective that you can run uh, um, at least if you have a lot of product data and and, it, and it's a very good very good starting point for for multi-document summarization at least if you you know if we're, we're in this domain of, of uh, product reviews okay very good thanks okay uh, we're actually running out of time so i'd like to thank Omer again for the very interesting talk and discussion and thank everyone for the questions. I'm sorry we didn't manage to go through all the questions. There are always a lot of nice questions at the end. But yeah, thanks again and see everyone at the next meetup. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.